Confidentiality, integrity, availability. In the last module of COVID cryptography, we looked at public key encryption. That is using public key cryptography to provide a confidentiality control. In this uh, module, we're going to be looking at digital signatures, which provides us with an integrity control. And as I keep reminding you, confidentiality is important, but many times integrity is much more important. So why is public key cryptography useful? It's because we've got, we can separate, use separate keys for separate roles. Public key encryption is much more powerful than symmetric because we can give the, somebody the ability to encrypt the message to us without giving them the ability to decrypt. What's the equivalent uh, transformation for a Mac? Well, it's called a digital signature and we have separate keys for signature and verification. And again, the signature key uh, is, this time is the one that's kept private and the verification key is going to be the one which is published in the telephone book. And this is a very useful and important capability because it now means that Alice can send a message to the rest of the world, sign it with her digital signature, and anybody who wants to check that message can now do so just by checking the signature on the document. The only thing that they need to do that check is to have Alice's public key, which they can look up from the telephone directory. And this is probably the most useful capability we get from modern cryptography. Okay, so how do we create digital signatures? Well, we can use the RSA crypto system, uh, which I mentioned in the last module. And at some point I'll do that, uh, but again, uh, since the world is moving to elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman for commercial crypto, it makes more sense to look at the Diffie-Hellman approach to doing signatures because the RSA signatures have the same work factor key size issue as RSA encryption. Um, if we want to have an acceptable modern work factor, we have to use keys that are just simply too long to be practical. So. Can we use Diffie-Hellman? Well, yes, we can. And the way that uh, we can do that was shown by Tahar Al-Gamal, and then there were a couple of refinements added by Klaus Schnorr. And it's very interesting because Schnorr signatures are, are uh, a construction that combine the use of public key and symmetric key cryptography um, in a way that really doesn't appear uh, in the rest of the modern crypto canon. Uh, okay, so what does um, a uh, Algamal, uh, Schnorr, DSA, whatever signature look like? Okay, so to create a signature, what Alice, Alice is going to start off with a public-private key pair. Her public key is going to be G to the A mod P, and her private key is going to be A. And to simplify the diagrams, for the rest of this um, course, or most of the rest of this module, I'm going to be dropping out the mod P piece because uh, I'm just going to take that as implicit in the operators. Um, it, otherwise, it just gets in the way and confuses. So she has this public key, public private key pair, and the public key is published in a telephone directory somewhere. First thing that she's going to do to create a particular signature is to generate a new random number K. And this value K, she's going to keep secret. I'm going to get, get to why that's really critically important uh, a little later on. First thing she's going to do then is going to be to calculate the, the value R, which is G to the power K, which is a time consuming operation but notice that we've not even seen the message that we're going to sign yet. So um, this allows for what's called online offline signatures. You can actually generate uh, a whole series of values of K and G to the K mod P and store them uh, in advance of needing them to sign. So you can be using your off-duty cycles of your processor to, to prepare documents for signature before they use, which is 
a really interesting um, thing you can do. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate a value e, which is a hash of that, that value r we just generated, and the concatenated to that, uh, the message that we're going to sign. Now, there's various ways that you can go about that concatenation. Um, it, it matters, but the details are, I'm going to elide here. Just take it that this is a principled one-way function and that E depends upon R and M in an acceptably secure uh, manner that's proof against uh, extension attacks and all that stuff. And then finally, we're going to calculate the value S, which is simply K plus the, pub the private key multiplied by the value E. And the signature value is then S and R, and both are presented mod P, of course. Now, this is interesting in that um, if you look, the, the actual signature step uh, is only involving uh, one multiplication and one addition. It's a really fast operation to perform, uh, no exponentials. So we can sign a bunch of documents really quickly if we've done that uh, proprietary work. Uh, there is, however, one very critical piece, and that if you look at our private key value, A, uh, that's in that S term, K S equals K plus A times E. So what that means is, well, since we're doing this all mod P, and since K is randomly chosen across the interval 0 and to P minus 1, what that means is that k is going to provide a blinding factor. Uh, it's going to uh, provide a one-time pad equivalent that uh, prevents anybody reverse engineering a from that value s knowing e alone. Because for any given value of s and e, there's a value of k and a that can make that equation work. So We've got the one-time pad capability of this is going to be perfectly secure, but only if K is genuinely random and it provided that K is never reused. Okay, so that's signature generation. How do we verify a signature? Well, the verifier is going to have the signature value, which is S and R, and also needs the message to be uh, verified. First thing they're going to do is they're going to calculate that value E by putting R and M through the same principled one-way function. So Bob, Carol, whoever calculates E. And then they're going to calculate two factors and check that they're the same. First of those factor is G to the power S and second is R plus the public key to the power e. And we can see that these two values should be the same, provided that uh, the value s equals k plus a times e by substituting the terms. So let's start off. g to the power s is going to be g to the power k plus a times e, which is g to the power k plus g to the power a times e, which is uh, r plus Alice's public key to the power e, which is exactly what uh, we told uh, Bob, Carol, and whatever to calculate. So that equality will hold provided that the signature values are correct. And so this is a very secure um, and very nice and convenient signature scheme. There is just one little thing that we've got to be careful of, and it, that is that it is absolutely vital that K is never revealed. And so when we implement this in a signature library, we want that library to generate K internally and then destroy it so that it doesn't get leaked to any other party that might be using um, the same machine. Um, and you know we'll come to cryptographic erasure, whatever, at some point in the future. It's also absolutely critical 
that we don't use the same value k to sign two messages. Why not? Well, the same reason that we don't reuse one-time pads. It's providing the same function here. If you have an attacker that knows that two messages have been signed using the same value k, then he can subtract one message from the other. And so S1 is equal to k plus a times e1. S2 is k equal to k plus a times e2. If we subtract S1 minus S2, well, that's going to be a times, a, a times E1 minus A times E2. Uh, solve for A, and we get A equals S1 minus S2 divided by E1 minus E2. And that's a calculation that we can perform really quickly uh, using modular arithmetic. Sad. So we've got to be really cautious in how we generate K. And this is how a lot of past implementations have um, come unstuck. So when we got together to define a new digital signature standard for use in the IETF, and this was done by the IRTF a few years back, uh, we advise people to use what's called a deterministic uh, approach to generating K. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the value k from the message we're going to sign and also some feature that depends upon the private key value a and we're going to use a one-way function to do it and so that guarantees that we will never reuse the value k for two different messages because we always change it for whatever we're doing. And also we guarantee that no, the value k depends upon information that is only available to the signer because a is only known to the signer. And the reason for this particular construction is that because it's deterministic, we can then write a unit test and we can check to see that if we initialize this cryptographic hardware module with a particular public private key, and we tell it to sign this particular document, we can check to see that the right value of k is being uh, produced because the signature is deterministic. Problem with this is that if we sign the same document over again and again and again and again, what can emerge is what's called a side channel, uh, in that you can have a side channel attack where we look at minute um, similarities from one iteration to another and we look at the correlations of the timings and the power and the spectrum and the, and the guy who's the uh, you know the the axe on this is a guy called Paul Kosher uh, who will also come to it at some point and the key, the point is that the value k can potentially leak and if k leaks then we can work out the private key value. And so in order to avoid that uh, leakage, uh, some people say, well, we want to have a non-deterministic uh, way of calculating K. And so what we're going to do is the same as before, except that this time we're going to introduce a random element in addition to the value of the message and also some private value that is only known to the signer. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be the private key at this point, so long as we never possibly use this value for any other signing key that might be involved. And this non-determinism allows us to defeat the side channel attacks. So at this point, we have three integrity functions. We've got the message digest, which doesn't require a key and provides an integrity check on a particular piece of data. But we, in order to verify it, we've got to know the message digest for that very specific piece of data. Then we have the message authentication code, where we use a key, uh, one to create the code, the same key to verify. And that allows us to uh, check the integrity of any piece of data provided that we know the secret key that was used to authenticate it. And that allows the recipient to know what the sender sent, 
but doesn't provide us with the ability to give any form of representation to any other third party because anything that the recipient knows is also known to the sender and vice versa and so the recipient can't say this definitely came from Alice because the recipient can always have forged that and sometimes that is not what you want at all but sometimes it is sometimes not having that non repudiation capability is actually preferable and then finally we have the digital signature where you have separate keys to sign and to verify and that allows us to provide an integrity check on the data provided only that we know the public key and this allows us to have the third party verification so Alice sends a signed message to Bob well Bob can then show that this message came from Alice or at least it came from somebody that knew the private key corresponding to what purports to be Alice's public key so at this point um, in any presentation there's usually somebody raising their hand is about saying can't you do this with blockchain and the answer almost always is no blockchain is irrelevant um, you know if I'm talking about um, confidentiality blockchain is an integrity solution it's not relevant blockchain does however allow you to fix digital documents to a particular point in time which are really useful integrity capabilities digital signatures allow you to fix a digital document to a particular purported sender or at least a particular private key combining those two capabilities is really useful and important and at some point in the future we'll be looking at how you do that but this is just one example not of using the public key system but of infrastructure cryptographic infrastructure built up on top of the um, public key system and we'll come back to that later on so blockchain or rather a one-way sequence you don't need that proof of work function one-way sequences combined with digital signature are very powerful and we have signature applications so what can we use a signature for well we can use them to sign code we use them to sign email we can use them to sign contracts um, each of those applications requires at least a module if not several modules in their own right because there are many considerations we not that uh, we need to come but we're not quite yet at the point where we can deal with those yet because although we've shown how we can use a public key we've not shown where the public key comes from we've just said you read it out of the telephone book well obviously telephones are going away I mean like you know the public key public telephone system um, when are they going to shut that down it's all become the internet long ago so telephone books who last used one of those um, we need a we need a proper infrastructure for distributing public keys that takes account of the fact that public keys are a different type of thing and the infrastructure that uh, handles that is called public key infrastructure and that's the equivalent of the telephone book and so that's what we're going to be discussing in the next module which is going to be talking about what is probably the most um, consequential master's thesis in history uh, if not this one well the FedEx uh, master's thesis would be the uh, other competitor this is a master's thesis written by an MIT student that created a billion dollar industry which in turn enabled the creation of a trillion dollar industry and so please come back for that course please um, click like please subscribe and please if you've got friends who are interested in computer security interested in learning about crypto please let them know about copy cryptography it's free and they can watch it online while we're all locked down uh, with the disease or avoiding getting the disease uh, so uh, please come back for that and thank you for watching thank you